day and age of Zoom meetings and working from home, there might actually be a pretty good chance that some of the audience is actually in their underwear at this moment. So, uh, so I guess that's kind of the, the way things are going with Zoom these days. So the other downside I think of Zoom is, I don't know how well that joke landed, so I'm just gonna stay blissfully aware that it killed and, and uh, everybody thought it was funny. So, um, so this presentation uh, initially uh, was planned for early April, I believe, and then things uh, changed with the COVID and so forth. And the presentation today is going to be a lot different, I think, or, or pretty different than initially that I had it planned. Um, for starters, obviously, we're on Zoom rather than in a conference room downstairs in the frontier, but there's some uh, much more important reasons that this presentation is going to be different. There are obviously massive uh, historical forces that are changing the world right before our eyes and changing the world in a lot of different ways in terms of, especially in terms of how we as business communicators uh, and organizations and brands, people responsible for, for communicating brands, or even as just individuals, the way we communicate with our audiences, whether they are customers or employees, internal audiences, or investors, or the general public, or whoever our, our audience might be. So I think with that in mind, I think that storytelling as a means of business communication is, is really more important than ever. Your audience, your customers, your employees, uh, the general public, the media, they're paying attention more so than ever before and communicating with them effectively and delivering the right message to them is critical. So in this presentation, I'm going to share what I think are my five rules. But before I do, I think we should talk a little bit about what we're talking about in terms of storytelling and what it means. Oh, hold on. What's the slide here? There we go, is that working? Great, so what is storytelling? Let's kind of define it here a little bit. Generally speaking, storytelling is in a very real sense, it's the way that human beings communicate with each other. Uh, it's what sets us apart from perhaps other members of the animal kingdom. Certainly there are other uh, animals and so forth that communicate with each other, but we're the only ones really that use stories to carry larger meanings and messages and learning and, and things of that nature. And if you think about, you know, every story that you've heard as a child when you were growing up, stories that your parents read to you before bed, or maybe if you went to church and you, stories that you heard uh, in that setting, and even all the way up to the present day, the movies that we watch and television shows that we watch and the books that we read, and even conversations that we have with uh, other individuals, the best ones, the ones that are most relatable, the ones that are most memorable, the ones that are most persuasive, inspiring, they all are carried by the best stories. And I think that goes for business communications as well. So for our purposes, obviously storytelling has uh, a lot of different meanings for different people, but in terms of, of business storytelling and, and using storytelling for professional communications, the definition in my mind is, is pretty simple. I'm having some trouble advancing the slides here, hold on. All right, so storytelling defined. First of all, it's remembering that your audience is made up of human beings. And that might sound obvious, but I think a lot of companies tend to forget that subconsciously because they're communicating or they're, they're creating content for search engines, uh, or they might be creating it for their own internal audiences, their own uh, C-suite and, and uh, um, managers within the company, and forgetting that the people on the other end of that content, the people on the other end of those messages, they're human beings and they, they want to be inspired and they want to be entertained and they want to be uh, informed and educated um, and yeah, I think we often, a lot of times we'll forget that. And then the other part of it is just to make your content, for lack of a better term, interesting. Um, you know, we, we again, kind of get caught up in communicating what's important to us, but we forget that, you know, people, 
that we communicate with, they don't necessarily want to be sold to or persuaded. They want to be, as I mentioned before, uh, entertained, entertained, and they want to be inspired and informed and so forth. So that's, that's really what storytelling is to me, is to, is to use various different tactics to, to make your content, your messages interesting and make people want to consume them. People have a lot of choices these days when it comes to the messages and the media that they consume. And if you don't grab their attention, and if you don't uh, remember that you know, you're commuting to, communicating to them as human beings, they can turn, tune you out in an instant. So why should organizations be concerned about storytelling? Why should they embrace storytelling as a means uh, uh, of communicating with their audiences and kind of making it part of their overall mix? And really the answer is because they're, they're already doing it. They're already storytellers, whether they want to or not, want to be or not. Last year, I had the honor of interviewing Shayla Carlson. She is from uh, Habitat for Humanity International. She's uh, the director of, uh, senior director of storytelling. She's got the word storytelling, obviously, right there in her name or in her title. And, um, Habitat for Humanity is an organization that really embraces the idea of storytelling to advance their goals and to reach their audiences all around the world. And she said that, you know, if you're in a role uh, that's responsible for communicating to an audience of any kind, whether it's marketing or advertising, internal communications, or even uh, other types of roles that aren't necessarily traditional communications roles, but um, do have a interaction with other audiences, sales and whatnot. She said, you're already a storyteller. Your organization is already telling a story by what you put out there and also by what you don't put out there. So it's critical that you take control of that message and, and communicate the messages and tell the stories that you want to tell. Otherwise, your audience is going to fill in the blanks for you. So... What does storytelling look like in the real world in terms of a, a business sense, uh, you know, achieving a business goal? And to answer that question, I, look, I wanna look at it in the context of one of the 20th century's most famous storytellers and a budget meeting that he had, of all things. And that of course is Winston Churchill. Um, during World War II, in the earlier days of World War II, Winston Churchill had to go to Parliament to ask for funds to try to increase the budget for development of new weapons. Now at that time, it was a pretty dark time in England's history. They were staring down the barrel of the advancing Nazis. Uh, the United States has not, had not uh, become involved in the war yet. And they were in, uh, there was a lot of uh, fear about what, what was coming. And they were also in some pretty dire straits economically. They uh, were spending money they didn't have, and it was it, things were getting pretty pretty bad in England. What Churchill could have done in that situation is he could have just taken the facts of the matter and laid them out in front of Parliament and said, "Look, you know, here's where we are right now. This is this is what we need to." to meet our goals in terms of developing weapons to defend our country. And here's, here's what, will, what the results will be. And I should mention, he had a lot of opposition at that time in parliament as well. It wasn't, uh, uh, you know, his word wasn't necessarily gospel at that point in history. So he could have lined everything out very logically and used facts and data to um, share his ideas, but instead he did something very different. He told a story. And he told the story about a battle that had taken some 40, taken place some 40 years before in Africa in 1898. And he used some really vivid imagery and uh, descriptions to share that story. And this is a, an excerpt of that story. He said, and I, I, can't, I, I can't do a Winston Churchill impression, so you'll just have to imagine what he sounded like. But he said, imagine if you had been one of our soldiers. You were far outnumbered and you knew it. You had been on the campaign for a long time and had not enjoyed a good cup of tea for many months, sometimes years. Inevitably, on this day, the temperature would climb again into the 100s, not a comfortable place for a Brit. 
and the air was so dry that your mouth felt you had swallowed sand, and the clean desert air you breathe was soon to be replaced with the burning smell of powder and blood. Now, few people have a gift for that kind of oration and storytelling like Winston Churchill does, but imagine yourself as being a member of parliament and listening to this. Using this method, using doing what Churchill did, he did more than just make the case for additional funding. He actually almost literally transported members of parliament to that battlefield in 1898. He put them in the boots of the soldiers and he made them feel the sense of fear and helplessness that they must have felt at that time. And then he equated that feeling to what the British soldiers of the present day in World War II would feel again, perhaps when facing the Nazis in, in the coming months. Now, Parliament, of course, accepted his proposal and the rest, of course, is history, but why did this approach work so well? Why does storytelling work so well on when you're communicating with other people? And the answer is in our brains. So that Churchill story that I just shared with you, it came from a book called The Persuasion Code by Christophe Moran and Patrick Renvois. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's a really interesting book about how uh, they explore how uh, different types of messaging and tactics and so forth affect the human brain and how that relates to being persuaded. And one of the things that they examine in uh, pretty good detail is the idea of storytelling. And there were some interesting things that they had found when they do brain mapping and when people listen to stories. If you, if you look back at the idea of just sharing the facts and data and being logical and linear and, um, and just being, uh, just sharing the, the information, you know, the straight facts, I guess, as it were, that only affects a certain part of the brain, the brain that has to deal with processing language. That's really all it does. But when you tell a story, it affects greater portions of the brain, even the whole brain. So when you talk about things like the smell of powder and blood, that lights up the section of the brain that has to deal with smell. Or the same thing holds true when you're talking, when you're describing visual elements or the, the, the way you feel, you know, tactically feel things or even uh, emotions like love and fear. When you describe those in a story, it lights up the brain, the part of the brain that, that deals with those areas. Even the area of taste, like tasting food. If you describe a juicy steak or a really sour lemon, your, your mouth will start to water because your brain doesn't necessarily make the distinction, the distinction between hearing the story and actually experiencing the event. So it's a really interesting book. I highly recommend it. Um, what they said was, uh, you know, stories work because they transport the mind of the audience and create a pseudo real experience. So when you do that, as I mentioned before, you engage the whole brain. Now, looking at it from a marketing standpoint and a business communication standpoint, if you can harness that power, even just a little bit, you can, you can really make a difference in how you reach and persuade and connect with your audiences. So I want to share some, I guess, real world examples, more, I guess, current real world examples of some people that I've talked to over the last year or so through my podcast and how they use storytelling in their, in their work. So I'm gonna start with uh, Tara Warwick. Now Tara is a business and IP lawyer with Carnes Warwick. Uh, they're located in downtown Raleigh. And in her work as a, as a business lawyer, she deals with a lot of dry information in terms of contracts and patents and you know, things of that nature, uh, business law kinds of things, not necessarily all that sexy. Um, and occasionally she will have to go to trial. And as you might imagine, the, the trials that she is involved with um, are not the types of trials that you see on TV with the criminal law and all kinds of exciting drama and so forth. Again, they, they tend to contain dull 
business disputes, uh, facts, matters of law, nuances and technicalities. I mean, it's exciting to her. It's, you know, it's her life's work. It's what she does. But if you can imagine being a jury in the, that type of situation, it's not necessarily very exciting to them. But in a court of law, you might assume, as I did, that really the only thing that matters are the facts, right? I mean, if you have the facts on your side, you lay out the facts for the jury and the judge to see, and you lay it out very logical, logically, and if the facts are on your side, you get the verdict you want. If the facts are not on your side, you don't get the verdict you want, and that's pretty much how it goes, right? Well, Tara said not necessarily. There's actually something a lot more important than stating the facts of the case, and it's actually quite simple. She said, you have to keep the jury awake. You have to engage them. I mean, the jury is going to be sitting there for hours and perhaps even days at a time and having to listen almost by force to a topic that's not necessarily interesting to them. So you have to make it interesting. You need to connect with them. A jury is just like any other audience. So how does she do it? She has a couple of different approaches, but the main thing that she said was she puts, she takes the facts of her case and she puts them into the framework of a, of a story as much as she can, a real story. And she gave me an example, sort of a, an anonymous example for purposes of uh, attorney-client privilege and whatnot, but she, she talked about the example of a, a mom and pop store and they moved into an area, you know, a generation or two ago and established this store that became a pillar in the community and they built up a clientele over, year, over years, and um, they scrimped and saved to make, you know, make this, this uh, store what they wanted it to be. They raised their children in it, and their grandchildren worked in it as, as they got older. And over the decades, they built it up into something that had some value. So when it came time to retire, they decided to sell it so they could enjoy the fruits of their labor. Well, then the person that they sold it to somehow breached the contract and then they were out, potentially out a lot of money. In a case like that, she said she wants the jury to identify with her client. She uses really specific examples in terms of the story of building the store and you know, the grandkids worked, working in the store and the emotions and everything that kind of goes along with it. She said it's, it's a useful way to not only make this, make her client relatable and have uh, the jury kind of put themselves, see themselves in her client's shoes, but also to make the key facts of the case easier to remember. If you associate an important fact of the case about when the breach of contract happened, if you associate that with a moment in time when they sat down and signed the contract and so forth, it's a lot easier for the jury to remember when they're in uh, deliberations. And this really surprised me. I mean, I, again, I thought that uh, jury trials were pretty much all about the facts, but she said that storytelling is a growing movement in trial, uh, trial law and attorneys are learning that they need to do more than just state the facts. They need to connect with their audience, with the jury. The next person that I would like, to, like you to meet is Erica Suter. Now, Erica is a soccer coach a youth soccer coach and strength and conditioning coach. Uh, she's based in the Baltimore area. She works with youth players roughly um, starting at around 10, 10 years of age, all the way up to high school and going into college age. And she helps them to you know, learn, you know, develop better soccer skills as well as overall athleticism. She mostly works with girls, but she also uh, works with, uh, with boys. And she's also a blogger. She um, blogs about fitness and just life in general. Now, when it comes to what she does, she has kind of an uphill battle because for those of you who might have had a child or have a child in youth sports, uh, as I do, um, a little bit difficult these days, um, hopefully we'll be able to get started up again soon, but there's a lot of kind of conventional wisdom and outdated thinking as it relates to youth sports, especially for girls, she says. 
Um, there's entrenched thinking about how kids need to specialize in one sport or else they won't get a scholarship and they need to work hard. So you need to run kids into the ground. And it's done a lot to kind of take the fun out of youth sports and take the, the joy out of it, of, of just simply being a kid. And her message really goes against all that. She incorporates uh, things like playing tag and, you know, with her younger, with her younger players and so forth. And just, she just wants her kids to have fun. Yes, she wants them to get better. And she, you know, works on the ones that are interested in getting college scholarships and so forth. She works with them to get better and stronger, but she wants them to have fun and enjoy life and try other things besides just soccer. And also as a blogger, she's on a little bit of a mission to inspire people to uh, you know, adults, anybody, uh, not just kids, to live a, a healthier life and be happy with who they are and be fit and active. So how does she do it? I mean, she's certainly not the only person to be a, a blogger in this kind of space or an influencer in this kind of space. But what she does is she doesn't hold back at all in terms of who she is. When she is talking with her friends, she uses a lot of uh, salty language and off-color humor perhaps and cultural references and so forth and that kind of comes through in her content as well now she's pulled back a little bit on the uh the salty language perhaps because she deals with kids but she's not afraid to be who she is she's she writes in very plain language almost as if she was talking to her friends and she's very very passionate her message really reflects her personality and the emotion behind what she says. And as a result, people love her. She's developed a following of, of thousands of followers uh, and has gotten attention from the mainstream uh, fitness media and so forth. And she uh, has heard from her audience that she inspires them to, to uh, uh, live a healthier life or to become stronger and to enjoy what they do. All right, so the last example that I want to share with you before we get into the five rules is uh, Barbara Gambarini. And Barbara is a really interesting case. Barbara is, um, she's a retired teacher, but she spends her time these days as what's known as a standardized patient. Now, before I met her, I didn't really know what a standardized patient was, but I did watch Seinfeld back in the 90s. And there, if you remember, there was an episode of Seinfeld when Kramer uh, and his friend Mickey got an acting job down at the medical school have, uh, pretending to have diseases so that the med students could practice uh, diagnosing them. Well, that's actually, I didn't know that was actually a thing, but that is actually what a standardized patient is, sort of. That's, that's a little bit of a funny simplification of it. What, what a standardized patient does is they are brought in for medical students so that they can uh, practice something that's really important for doctors. Besides, it's not really about the diagnosis necessarily. It's more about the bedside manner and interacting with patients and getting their stories, finding out what's really going on. Uh, standardized patients are really the only way that medical students can practice that skill. They can learn all of the medical stuff and the science stuff in school and in rotations and whatnot, but uh, the, the only way that they can learn, at least in, in the early stages, this bedside manner is through standardized patients. So she really has to bring her A game. She has to uh, act like a serious method actor might, uh, might act and might prepare. She really takes the time to get into character. She studies her lines. She learns the backstory of her character. And she's prepared for any questions that the medical students might ask because that's really the point. That's what they're there to learn. They're learn they're, they are there to learn how to ask the right questions to get to the ultimate diagnosis. And she gave the example of one time she was assigned to uh, present with uh, some sort of physical injury. I can't remember what it was, like some bruises on her arm and perhaps uh, a possible broken arm or something like that. Pretty, pretty straightforward, right? In terms of uh, medical needs, you can look at that. Most medical students could look at that and, and know what to do. But her, her character's backstory was that she was abused by her, by her husband. And that's not something that an abuse victim would come right out and say. That's something that 
a doctor or a, a physician's assistant or a medical professional would have to draw out of them somehow through being able to ask the right questions and knowing what to look for in her in their answers and that's that's her job it's it's something that's really important to her she she knows what her students need they need her to be in her character at all times she cannot break character if she does then the lesson gets kind of kind of ruined and and the interaction is not as authentic so she really devotes herself to giving her students what they need and simply put the reason she does it is because she loves them she really enjoys being a part of shaping the next generation of future doctors and helping them to provide better care for their patients and she so she really enjoys that and that's uh, be, as a consequence of that she really works hard to do a good job all right so let's get into it these are the the five rules that i've I, that i have uh, identified as uh, the five rules of storytelling um, really however there's just one that's the most important, and I will save that to for last, of course. That's how you do these kinds of things. But we'll get into this now as far as the, the five rules of storytelling. And the first one is to know your purpose. I think the, the question that organizations need to ask themselves is, why do we exist? And I'm not talking about uh, existing for the purpose of creating shareholder value or making money or selling widgets or offering services and so forth. But on a deeper, I guess, more human level than that, what problem do you solve? What need do you feel? How, how do you help people? Those are all questions that uh, organizations need to answer in order to have a strong sense of who they are in terms of their purpose and knowing that is, is critical in terms of uh, being able to deliver the right messages and the right uh, products and services to those customers and thinking of it in, in human terms. So I go back again to Barbara, who you just met. She has a strong sense of who she is and why she does what she does. She knows that she is there to help create a better future in the healthcare industry. And that's, that's her role. She knows her, her purpose and she acts accordingly. Rule number two is to be real. It's really important. A lot of times you see uh, organizations, especially ones that you know, perhaps aren't as skilled at uh, communications and so forth, try to be something that they're not. They try to be funny or they try to be, have a strong sense of uh, community or, or something like that. And all of those are are great, but if it's not ingrained in terms of who they are, then it tends to fall flat and people can see right through that. So you need to, as an organization, you need to be aware of who you are and what special things that you bring to, to the world and, and have that kind of shine through in terms of how you communicate and the stories you tell. And find your voice. Use, find a voice that's authentic to you, that's real to you, and let that drive who you are and let that drive the, the messages that you share with your audience. And again, and, sorry, okay. can you go back to rule one and hit that rule again? Uh, sure. Know your purpose. Yeah. We just had a question. Um, I think someone missed rule one. So could you just quickly go over rule one one more time? Sure. Sure. So uh, know your purpose. Um, basically why do you exist as an organization? What is, uh, the most important, or what, what do you do? What's your, what's your, I guess, reason for being? And again, it's not just about uh, making money or selling things. It's about the problems that you solve for your customers or for your audience or the need that you fill or, and how do you help people. Understanding that and kind of being grounded in that human purpose is critical for how you proceed uh, moving forward with uh, um, with your communications. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Thanks, Chris. Sure. All right. So uh, being real, I, as I mentioned before, um, I'm not sure where I left off on this, but um, the idea is you have to be true to yourself, um, either as an individual or as a company or an organization. You have to uh, 
Um, don't try to be something you're not. Don't try to be uh, communicate in a way that's not uh, part of your organization's DNA. Um, and the example I give on this is uh, going back to Erica. She's somebody who is not afraid to be who she is. She lets her personality shine through and she doesn't apologize for it. She does, you know, she gets some, some detractors. Some people are not necessarily happy with uh, the way she communicates, but more often than not, she's able to reach her audience and her audience uh, enjoys her message. The third rule is to embrace emotion. Now, this is something that I think a lot of organizations might struggle with. Some do it pretty well, but others try to be too matter of fact and are afraid of the emotional side of what they do and the emotional side of what, why their audience is, and why their customers are their customers and why their audience is paying attention. Emotion, people make decisions based on emotion. I mean, that's, that's just a fact of, of life in terms of being a human being. Um, even, you know, the most technical people, engineers and accountants and, and people who think they're very analytical, they might justify their decisions based on the data, but um, more often than not, emotion is what leads the way. So certainly, you know, facts and data and features and benefits are important, but if you can find a way to tap into the emotional side of why you want your audience to take the action you want them to take, then it's going to get you a lot farther. You're going to be able to light up those part portions of the brain that I mentioned before, and your message is going to be more memorable. Uh, the example I give again here is with Tara. You know, she works in a court of law where you would think emotion has no place in terms of business trials and so forth, but she, she uses emotion a lot to really tug at the heartstrings of the juries and get them to come around to uh, her client's uh, way of thinking. And then the fourth rule is to commit. Um, storytelling is, when it comes to business communications, is, is kind of a long game. Um, it requires uh, measures of patience and bravery and experimentation. You're not always going to get it right every time, right away. Um, and you can't always draw a straight line from your storytelling activity to any kind of return on investment. In the long term, it pays off. But in the short term, it's difficult to justify in terms of, you know, you're not necessarily selling anything, selling anything right away. Um, you are, it's more about kind of building your brand, building your reputation and kind of creating that foundation of, uh, being for lack of a better term, likable. Uh, you know, remember your audience is in control They They don't want to be sold to unless they're ready to be sold to. Uh, but they want to know who you are and they want to know how you fit into their lives. And they want to know that you are putting their needs first. And that brings me to the fifth rule, and really the most important, if you uh, take just one thing away from, from this presentation, I hope it's this. Understand your audience. That's really, that should be rule number one, but for dramatic effect, I put it at rule number five. Um, you have to know, your audience is the most important part of this equation, period. You have to know who they are. And when I say that, I mean, not just demographics, I'm talking about who they really are. What's important to them? What keeps them up at night? What, why do they make the decisions that they make as it relates to your place, uh, your products, your services, and so forth? And what are their stories? Understanding who your customers are and, and where they are and their stories and how they got from where they were to where they are now to interacting with you and where they will go in the future. You know, how will they use what you offer to make their lives better? If you know your audience well, you can, you can create better content that's going to light up those parts of the brain that I mentioned before, but it even goes beyond that. It, it, can, it can allow you to design and create better products and services that serve their needs better. It will help you to not lose sight of who you are and who you serve as an organization. A lot of times we see organizations that kind of lose their way 
and uh, get involved in some scandals and so forth. And I think at a very basic level, it's because that they lost sight of who they are and what's really important. And it allows you to insert your brand, your product, your service, your organization. You can insert yourself into your audience's stories in a meaningful way without being forced and without being interruptive like a lot of uh, traditional advertising and other uh, messaging is, is used these days. Now, do you need to use storytelling all the time? Do you need to use, uh, does everything you do have to have kind of this narrative format and, and be uh, emotional and, uh, and you know, light up every section of the brain and so forth? No, of course not. There, there are, there's a time and a place for more straightforward types of messages that fill an important need, that give inform in audiences information that they, that they need and are looking for right now. But I, I tend to think that in the environment that we're in right now, that storytelling is really more important than it's ever been. So I don't know if you are familiar with Jocko Willink. Jocko is a, a former Navy SEAL, and he is, uh, has developed, a, a, I guess, a corporate leadership consulting business, and he has a podcast and a YouTube channel and so forth. He's a really interesting guy and has a lot of interesting things to say. And a few weeks ago, Jocko posted a really important YouTube video on his YouTube channel. It was... It was at the height of all of the protests and the violence happening in a lot of the cities across the country. And what Jocko did was he pleaded to everybody, to police, to protesters, to everybody who's involved, to remember that the person who is standing across from them is another human being. But he didn't just say that. He, he used a story. And what he did was he told a story of something that happened on the front lines of World War I on Christmas Eve in 1914. It was a quiet night, he said. Uh, British soldiers heard the German soldiers from across no man's land. They were laughing and they were singing Christmas carols. And the story goes that the Germans called the English over, promising not to fire on them, to share in some Christmas cheer. And they did. And for a short time in that small corner of the war, the fighting stopped and they enjoyed each other's company on a, a very kind of sacred evening. Now, of course, that didn't last. You know, the war went on after that and soon the fighting resumed. But Jacko's point was that in, the, in that moment, those soldiers saw each other, not as enemies, but as humans, as other people. And I think there's a lesson to be learned here certainly as it relates to uh, things that are going on in the country, you know, with regards to police and protesters and so forth. But, but even for, for people like us, organizations, companies, uh, people who are responsible for communicating with our audiences, never forget that your audience, whether they're your customers, your employees, uh, the general public, the media, students, you know, depending on what your organization's goals are, the people that you're communicating with are human beings, they're people. And having that understanding will not only help you communicate with them, but will allow you to help them, will allow you to inspire them, and it will allow you to celebrate them more effectively. These days, a lot of companies are really struggling to find the right tone in terms of how to communicate with their audience, uh, audiences amidst everything that's going on. But I think that if they just stay focused on their audience and let their stories be their, be their guide, they perhaps might not struggle quite so much. So hey Chris, we've got a quick question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this came a little earlier. Um, so know your reason for being or know your reason for telling the story. Is there a difference between the two? There, that's a good question. Um, there is a difference between the two. I would say they're equally important. Or, well, starting with, you know, know your reason for being, that's probably the base level thing that you as an organization need, you know, that's a mission statement, right? But um, you need to know, uh, you know, why your organization exists, why, you know, why you do what you do. Um, knowing your reason for telling the story, there's, that's kind of a double-edged sword a little bit because, you know, certainly there's an action that you perhaps might want your audience to take. 
but maybe not. Sometimes, you know, telling the story is more about just kind of demonstrating who you are, who you are as an organization, maybe demonstrating your authority in a certain field or um, uh, building your brand and so forth. There's a lot of different ways and reasons to, uh, to use storytelling and, you know, way too many for, for me to cover in, in a, in a one hour presentation. And it really depends on who you are as an organization, but yes, it's, it is important to, to know that as well. Know the, know the reason for, for telling your story as well as perhaps most importantly, knowing who you are as an organization. Does that make sense? Perfect. Thanks, Chris. Sure. So anyway, uh, you see here the link uh, to the um, Jocko's video. I wanted to share it, um, or, or a portion of it. It's about an eight minute video. Uh, I wanted to share a portion of it here, but uh, the Zoom isn't necessarily the best for that kind of thing. So I urge you to, uh, if you haven't seen it, to um, take a look at it when you get a chance. It's just the, the bit.ly and then Jocko-people. You can find it at that link. Um, I shortened it there for you so it's uh, easier to remember. So that's it. Uh, those are, that's my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Um, if you're so inclined, I would invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn. But um, also, as I mentioned before, I have a podcast called The Storytelling Companion. You can find it on Apple, Google, uh, Spotify, and Stitcher, or just by going to that uh, link there, that wave link that slash storytelling companion. Um, I've been on hiatus for a couple months, but I'm working on starting it up here pretty soon. So certainly if you know of anybody who is, would make a good person to interview, I would love to hear about it. But uh, regardless, I invite you to take a listen to, there's about 25 episodes or so available. Take a listen, let me know what you think. And with that, I would be happy to answer any additional questions. If anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat. We can answer them that way, or you can unmute yourself and ask them, uh, whatever you feel most comfortable. Um, but for those of you that are you know, finished and gonna go grab some lunch and get on back to your day, thank you for coming. We do have another event, another on the menu coming up on July 21st. Um, that one is called Camera Ready. So it has to do with, um, more recording content and sharing it with your audience, but in this kind of Zoom world we're in now, it also has to do with um, Zoom meetings and making sure you're comfortable, confident, and uh, getting your point across to your audience. Thanks everybody. All right. Well, thank you. I thank you everybody for your time. Um, certainly, if you think of another question, you feel free to reach me on the on the links there below. But uh, um, it's been enjoyable. I'll obviously hang out here for a little bit uh, to see if there are any additional questions. But uh, uh, I, it's been a thrill. Thank you very much. And thanks, Amanda, for setting this up. Of course. Thanks, Chris.